Hello everyone, Kibler here. Uh, today I want to talk once again about the current state of the standard metagame, uh, now in the wake of the recent balance patch uh, that incidentally happened basically uh, right after my previous video uh, and was sort of leaked slash hinted slash announced basically the same day that video went up. Um, so if the if the folks over at the Hearthstone team uh, were even considering uh, including some of the suggestions that I made uh, in their balance changes, uh, they wouldn't have had the opportunity to. So here is another opportunity to possibly get some insight from me as to uh, you know what I think the state of the metagame is and uh, how things might be more fun if some things were changed. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what was changed. The the big change, rather changes, really were Vile Library and Snowfall Guardian both getting hit. Uh, Vile Library being reduced to uh, only plus one, plus one per imp, rather than plus one, plus one, then repeated per imp. Uh, and Snowfall Guardian losing any growth uh, from Frozen Minions and just becoming a base 5-5. Five, five. At the time of the balance patch, uh, Imp Warlock and Control Shaman were two of the uh, top performing decks. And since then, they have fallen off sort of the radar largely and have been supplanted by the unnerfed Mage and Druid and the buffed Rogue, sort of at the top of the metagame heap. The the Rogue uh, buff being Edwin, uh, which I think is, is an interesting case, both in terms of, I think, kind of an, like a, a problematic card to target for a buff, since it was already a powerful card, um, but also in the case of buffs and balance changes, period, but specifically buffs uh, occurring so soon after the release of an expansion, uh, when really all the data of what the possible strong decks that exist in the metagame hasn't necessarily been gathered. The uh, sort of Lamby Rogue, as people are calling it, the uh, Sinstone Graveyard plus Wild Pod Knoll plus Draka, whatever sort of spell combo style deck, um, had kind of only surfaced at the Masters Tour after the buffs were locked in and Edwin was chosen as the target for a buff um, and then has since become one of the most uh, prominent and powerful decks on ladder with the addition of the buffed Edwin. And you could argue, you know, well, you know, they shouldn't, they shouldn't be buffing a card like Edwin, period, I think, because Edwin was already a pretty strong card and is the sort of card that the cheaper it gets, the more it can sort of take over a game and create non-games, kind of like the original Edwin, right? That would sort of, you know, come down as a 12-12 on turn two or whatever and, you know, kind of just end the game. This one is, is you know, at least somewhat less likely to do that, uh, but with the number of zero mana spells and enablers for zero mana spells that you're able to play, uh, in Rogue these days, you know, even at, you know, three costs can come down huge in the early game or come down and just get shadow stepped and really go off uh, and both generate uh, resources and a huge board for the Rogue very quickly. So regardless of, of your position of like, should they or should they have not buffed Edwin, maybe target other things, uh, you know, I, I do think that the sort of the, the general lesson perhaps to be learned from the way that this patch was approached um, is that that buffs are despite how much people clamor for them rather than nerfs because they're much happier to see their cards become more powerful and generally like why not just make everything as powerful as most powerful things well they tried to do a lot of buffing in this patch and did significant buffs to paladin and demon hunter and warrior and those classes are still not performing because of sort of the structural problems they have fighting against the top decks uh like mage and druid you know you can only have and basically any kind of minion deck do so well in a world where, you know, you're able to freeze everything, kill everything, go over the top of everything that isn't like an ultra, ultra fast aggro deck, which the nerf to Imp Warlock removed at least the most powerful of those that did exist in the previous metagame. Uh, so those decks that, that kind of have the, the opportunity to build up and then sort of snowball out of control like Druid or, you know, like, like uh, Mage with hero power stuff, I've kind of taken over. Um, with Rogue as kind of this uh, this boogeyman that that both is able to uh, you know have these explosive uh, explosive wins, but also largely pushes out a lot of decks that can't deal with the sort of stuff that it does because it is also good at kind of playing an honest game thanks to the existence of Wild Paw Knoll in the deck. This is kind of a, a like how did we get here? Where are we to start things off? And here's my thoughts on where I'd like to see us go. As far as the, you know, the sort of the top decks, Druid and Mage and Rogue right now are really the sort of top performing decks in the metagame. I've seen some people say, oh, the patch made things worse because now there's, you know, these decks and Sham instead of Shaman, it's like, well, there's basically just kind of Rogue instead of Shaman. And, you know, yes, like Imp Block is gone or whatever, or maybe, it's, maybe it's Rogue instead of Imp Block or whatever. And uh, you do still see some people playing Control Shaman. I know uh, Meaty has been playing uh, Control Shaman to some success, even without Snowfall Guardian. So regardless of, of what the sort of, you know, status is, 
uh, I, I think it's pretty clear that those uh, those classes are, you know, kind of head and shoulders and are defining the metagame due to that being head and shoulders kind of above a lot of the rest. Um, and I, I talked a lot about Mage and Druid in my previous video, which, uh, you know, may be worth watching if you haven't already, or re-watching if you care to, where, you know, I, I discussed that the sort of problem of a class like Mage and a class like, like Druid in the way that they are powerful right now has a lot to do with things that can't fundamentally be interacted with the opponent, specifically the amount that Druid can sort of ramp and go over the top of just about everything and the consistency with which it does it, thanks to the sheer number of, of sort of tutor type effects in the form of Jerry Rig Carpenter and Moonlit Guidance and Aquatic Form uh, they have access to, as well as the redundancy from like Widow Bloom and, and things like that. Um, and then Mage, specifically just the sheer power and, and frankly frustration um, of uh, Magister Dongrass specifically, but also the the amount of freeze that the deck is capable of. Most notably, the location, the power level of that, alongside you know just the the amount of of sustain and removal the deck has. You know those are those are difficult decks to to target, right? Like Druid. If you look at the the statistics for Druid, really Druid is absolutely crushing to anything that is not like an aggressive deck. You know it, it loses horribly to decks that are extremely aggressive, and especially those that have any kind of you know disruption like. You know, one of the one of the top performing decks right now is Beast Druid, which I don't know why it's called Beast Druid because there's really no beasts in it. Basically, like token-ish aggro druid um, that's looking to, you know, play a bunch of small minions and buff them, and that's very very good against druid because, well, especially if, if one of those minions is like a trog, for instance, it's very hard for you to to really do anything without your ability to set up. And you know that deck, deck is also like just pretty solid in general against a lot of the decks that that like kind of take more time. Um, it's just like a pretty powerful thing against anything that isn't, you know, a, a very removal heavy deck like Quest Priest, which is one of the decks that we actually see showing up specifically to beat Rogue because Rogue like kind of goes in on this stuff. And then it's like, well, if you have Shadowed Ruins and the ability to sustain yourself against their burn, they're often just going to lose because um, they're very kind of one dimensional, but they're very good at doing that one dimensional thing, which punishes a lot of other decks that don't have access to that kind of removal. And then uh, Mage. Mage is also sort of in this position of like, well, the thing I do is something that you can't like kind of naturally interact with um, in the form of specifically Magister Dongrasp. I think Magister Dongrasp is the major problem card in Mage. That alongside the Nightcloak Sanctum, the new, the location, are the two cards that I suggested ought to be nerfed, and I still feel that way. The Magister Dongrasp, I think, is is the, the biggest defender, and, and I think you can really see just how sort of nutty this card is if you just look at like Big Spell Mage which is one of the most successful uh, decks currently, if you look at statistics uh, on Legend Ladder. The the fact that Magister Dongrasp and Reckless Apprentice are played in a deck that has absolutely no way to buff its hero power because those are, you know, just such game-ending cards, like just Dongrasp by itself, recasting no spells, ping a thing, Reckless Apprentice, take over the game with the hero power. That's sort of nuts, right? Like if you, if you really think about like how much power is in just that individual card, and it's a card that outside of, of stealing it with Theotar, there's nothing your opponent can do about it, right? It's not like it's a minion that you can like, you know, kill. It's not like it's something, it's not even something you really have to set up to necessarily. You just play it, right? And that's one of the things about specifically the hero cards that have so much power in them. Uh, so much long-term power because of their hero power, and specifically the two that are obviously very relevant in Standard right now are Dongrasp and Guff. They're not like a, like, Denathrius or whatever, where you have to set up to them being powerful. You just play them, right? You just play them, and they kind of slowly take over the game, and there's really nothing your opponent can do about it. And I think that having cards like that in Standard period... Uh, is just very frustrating as those being like among the most powerful things that uh, exist in the game mode. And th specifically like, you know, Guff being so efficient at basically everything, like it's a ramp and draw that gives you ramp and draw and the ramp it gives you is the most efficient ramp in the game. You're paying effectively one mana for additional mana every turn and you get access to 20 mana over the game. Obviously just kind of nuts. You know, people have been complaining about Guff and I think understandably so for quite a while. I have, have retained the, the perspective, the position that I think that the bigger problem is just the sheer consistency of everything else the deck is doing, that it plays basically the same game every time uh, because of, you know, the amount of cards that even in a 40 card deck give you so much redundancy in terms of your ramp and access to things. And frankly, Druid no longer having meaningful weaknesses outside of just getting absolutely rushed down. Like it used to be, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to try and beat Druid by playing like giants, right? Like playing huge minions. 
But between like Flipper Friends and specifically uh, Scale of Anixia, they have so much removal for basically anything that you do. And again, because they have Flipper Friends and Scale of Anixia and so many ways to get both of them and maybe to discover more of them with planted evidence, the, the amount of redundancy they have in these effects and the amount of times that they can happen in the game is is just like kind of astronomical. And you just it's it's shocking when they don't have it rather than, you know, oh, well, phew, they didn't have it. It's like, oh, my God. This game that didn't actually have the thing, because again, even with a forty card deck, which which gives them even more insulation against anything but the the most explosive aggressive decks, uh, if you're trying to play anything mid rangey that's chipping away at your opponent's life total, forget it, because forty life plus all of these things makes it even more difficult to ever possibly kill them. You know, you're you're gonna have a bad time. Um, so those three decks considered, I would love to see changes to all three of them, um, specifically. You know, I think that, as I mentioned, I think the two hero cards are places that I definitely like to see changes. Um, and I don't even think they necessarily have to be hugely changed, right? I think that if those, if the uh, the long term power of, you know, for instance, the the like Guff or Magister are changed, you know, like they could they could possibly increase in cost. I'd rather see them like decreased in power once they're played, uh, because I think that the the cost of them obviously you could increase them significantly, and then they get much weaker. Um, but I think the the re repetitive effect of the hero power every turn being as strong as it is in both the cases um, is, you know, what leads to these kind of feeling just so frustrating to play against and take over games so easily. And I think that, you know, more of the power of Guff, for instance, being the fact that it gives you access to the possibility of having 20 mana, more of the power of Dongrass being that it replays your spells you know, it, it takes them to different places in, in terms of, like, you know, how you want to to use them in the metagame. Um, I think Guff doesn't necessarily, you know, change much, but if, if Dongrass, for instance, the change that I like to see is instead of being your hero power increases by two with the honorable kill, increases by one, then it's still powerful, but takes a lot longer to take over the game. The sort of feeling of helplessness that in, in gen, engenders uh, goes down. And also consider seeing the hero power not start at two anymore. Um, the hero power be just you know, deal one damage, honorable kill, gain one attack, like kind of the double nerf there. And part of that is just how easy it is for you to start upgrading it because it starts at two and mage makes two twos with, with Valdo skeletons all the time. If it's just like, if it starts at one and upgrades by one, then so much more of the power of the card is in the battle cry, the replay effect, which also makes it a more interesting card in terms of the dynamics of like, hey, when do you want to play this? Rather than why well, obviously always want to play Dongrasp right away. And it, you know, it becomes like more of like, hey, okay, I want to get value from repeating these spells. And like when Dongrasp was first released, right before it was buffed, um, I feel like it was more of like, hey, I'm playing this with big stuff that I want to recast. And since then, it has basically become, okay, well, this is just a, a card that takes over the game with its hero power. Uh, and I think the former is much more interesting, both in terms of deck building and gameplay, and also just like much less frustrating to play against. So I, I would prefer for more of the power of Dongrass to be in its battle cry and less of the power to be in the hero power. Similarly, I think that Guff, so much of the power is already in the battle cry that you get access to 20 mana throughout the game that you can significantly reduce the power of the hero power and Guff still remains like a very strong card. Um, the, the single change that I'd love to see in, in Druid, um, as I mentioned in my previous video, is that I'd like to see the, the hero power uh, weakened to only give empty mana crystals. I'd also love to see that on Nourish because it is baffling to me that these these are cards that like give you full mana crystals that you can use this turn when they're already extremely powerful like double ramp for five is already good and like why is it also letting you use more mana because it's effectively double ramp for three in lots of situations especially in combination with the existence of guff um like nourish being returned to five mana like after it had previously been nerfed and having so many ways to find it and you know existing in the same format as guff i think it's just a really really dangerous position and you know makes games play out a lot more more similarly like decks don't have to play much in the way of like early game sort of ways to stay alive because they can just well I'll nourish and cast my spells and you know dig to this so I, I just think that that druid ramp in general is is like just too, a bit too good right now and and again I I, I think that the issue that I'm, I'm specifically trying to find ways within the existence of the current design direction for druid to actually fix these things because optimally I just like to see less redundancy in terms of the way that Druid functions with all the cards like Aquatic Farm and uh, Jerry Carpenter and uh, Moonlit Guidance that give them access to so many of the same things in their deck, you know, so the games just play out more differently because they have more different cards that they're playing rather than just playing the same cards over and over because their deck searches for them. 
Uh, but that's kind of a bigger picture problem. And it isn't the sort of thing that you just solve with a couple of changes. That's like, hey, I think this whole card pool kind of go is going in the wrong direction for the games to be more fun. But like my, my concern right now is like, hey, how do I make this less oppressive in the games that this, you know, is is involved in? And, and those, I think, are the changes I'd like to see to do that specifically. Um, I would also like to see the uh, the change to Kael'thas that I mentioned in the previous video, that either it becomes like fourth minion or, or maybe Kael'thas himself costs eight, so you can't just easily play Kael'thas brand Denathrius because that being kind of a thing that people see and in the game constantly makes people hate Denathrius, who I think is, as the title of my previous video was, you know, Sire Denathrius did nothing wrong. I don't think Denathrius is fundamentally the problem in like these games that are being ended by that card. I think that far more of the issue is the fact that it is easily doubled uh, I have seen some people say that, oh, well, Bran is the problem. I think Bran is a cool card, though. Like, Kael'thas doesn't really do much that's, like, cool outside of enable these ridiculous, like, combo plays that, yes, involve Bran, and, yes, if you do change Kael'thas, it still allows things like uh, like Druid to be able to Bran plus uh, Denathrius, and it still allows, say, Shaman to, like, Denathrius and then Makat. But those are, like... Not just, you know, you're not just getting one turn killed by, you know, at least the Shaman version. Uh, obviously, it can, it can kill you, but, like, you, you have, you have at least, there's at least some setup happening because you have to spend the 10 mana playing the Denathrius and then also do this thing the next turn. And your opponent has some opportunity to possibly respond to that um, as opposed to, like, well, you know, just buh, double, double shot you in one turn with no setup really necessary other than having a bunch of my stuff die. Um, so that's really the sort of the direction I feel for those. Rogue, I think, is is uh, more of an issue of... Wild Panol. Wild Panol, uh, well, obviously the, the, Edwin, the Edwin buff was something that I think is quite questionable. Um, I think the biggest problem in Rogues, period, right now, is Wild Panol. I hate the Wild Panol Maester interaction. The fact that, like, you know, you literally just draw some cards and trade some cards, and now you have a zero cost 3-5 with Rush. The fact that you can play a deck that has so few minions, like the, the commonly played one right now, so you almost always can, you know, cast your Shroud of Concealment and find Wild Panol or these, you know, other, other like, super powerful combo cards in your deck. So that, you know, you you are powerful in this explosive way that you can, like, you know, like push down a lot of decks, but also have three, five rushes for free that you can play to defend yourself so that it's difficult to beat you with minion pressure unless it's, like, ultra, ultra, you know, like, fast and powerful. That's just kind of dumb, right? Like, I think Null is a cool card if it is a reward for actually playing a deck that is using the Thief cards. Historically speaking, stuff like Vendetta you know, uh, like Undercity Fence, you know, these were cards that were were under-costed that you got like a, a tempo advantage back because it helped essentially pay you back for the mana that you spent on your Thief cards, right? If you have to spend mana stealing your opponent's cards, then you need to have some sort of tempo advantage to get that mana back for, you know, uh, cards like those that I mentioned before and Wild Panol, right? And you know, like, I get that, like, maybe Maester was designed, or rather, uh, Noel was designed to work with Maester specifically, but it's dumb, right? Like, I, 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 that interaction is super frustrating. Zero cost, three, five rushes should not be something you have access to just because you put a card in your deck. And it, it allows decks like the existing sort of Miracle Roguish one to have an unreasonable amount of, of both defense against minion pressure from opposing decks and pressure that is not sort of part of their combo on top of the zero cost cards that help enable their combo. So that is the single thing that I would, I would prefer to see changed. If we're going to change one thing in Rogue, I don't care if Edwin stays at three, right? I, I might think that the, the decision to change it, you know, to, to three was a mistake in the first place. But the bigger problem is Wild Panol. <laughs> it's both too powerful, I think, and just too dumb in terms of how those interactions work. And, you know, you could possibly change it by making it, if you if you trade a card of a class, that it also reveals you. That's one of the biggest ways that these, these you know, Maester decks end up, you know, actually getting the, the discounts on it so that, you know, they just trade and trade and then cast, uh, what, oftentimes they literally just have to trade, coin, shroud, zero cost, get you, double three, five rush on turn two. Cool. Huge setup I had to do there. But I think that... <laughs> You know, like, I think I think that making Noel a, a powerful card in the decks that actually work for it is important. And I'd rather see like Noel be like a better card, but not work with Maestra, right? Like ha have it, I don't know, be like a four cost three, five rush that's reduced for each non rogue card, you know, non rogue clash card that's added to your hand. So you can get it this powerful thing, but only if you're actually playing a deck that's working to subsidize it. 
you know, rather than like, hey, this is a deck that that just trades Cutlass, which is already good to do. But yeah, those are uh, a lot of my thoughts. Oh, I also, I specifically mentioned before um, that I think location was another one of the problems with, with Mage. I'd love to see the location reduced to two, two durability, just too much uh, ability to just generate value, power up your stuff, freeze your opponent's stuff. Freezing is one of those very frustrating mechanics that may, that, you know, we saw... Uh, Snowfall Guardian get nerfed because it was, you know, so powerful. And obviously the fact that Snowfall also ended the game by itself, you know, but like the, the freeze, the freeze location, let's just, let's just tone that down. I think it's a little bit too good. Um, and, and also I think that the, the power level and prominence of freeze effects, um, while you could say, well, you can just play, uh, you can just play Starfish. I think that Starfish and the popularity of Starfish because of the power level of a lot of these freeze things is one of the things that's holding other decks down. I talked about this, I think, a little bit uh, in my previous video as well, but like in Rage Warrior, for instance, Starfish is the most frustrating card to just happen to run into when you're playing a deck that like, you're like, okay, Anima Extractor, I use it to buff like my, my Acolyte of Pain, I use to buff something else, play those. Ha ha, look at my board, it's so awesome. Someone's just like silence all of them. And it's just like, you're not playing that card to beat me, you're playing that card to beat all, the, all these other things. And it's... You know, I, I actually hate like Starfish as a card. I think that a card that powerful as sort of a generic silence thing just ruins tons of fun. And I get that it was very likely created because it was like, hey, we want more anti-freeze stuff. But it is it is the sort of thing that makes lots of decks that otherwise could be a ton of fun. Um, and I think that you you do want things like that, but one that'd be a little bit weaker and a little bit less frequently played just as a generic answer to stuff like freeze because wow, does it suck to run into that because it's so easy for people to play it, uh, to get the utility out of it, because it's good against freeze effect. Uh, if someone is, is like, I'm playing this to beat buff cards, great, you know? But if it's in every deck because freezing is so powerful and popular, um, I think that's that's kind of a miss, and I'd rather see things like Living Dragon Breath that are more specifically targeted at anti-freeze, so you don't just have anyone trying to do anything cool with the, their minions in play, getting absolutely screwed over by their opponents playing Starfishes on a regular basis. But I, I don't think that we're like kind of in a sky is falling situation. Um, you know, I, I've seen people play, oh, the metagame's worse than it was before, and it's like, well, I think there are a lot of things that you can play that are like reasonable. Um, I do think that I, you know, the, the things that I mentioned ought to be nerfed, and maybe there's some other possibilities for buffs out there. But again, I think that that buffs uh, are potentially a dangerous thing, as we saw with Edwin, and also specifically don't necessarily get the job done, as we saw with a ton of stuff getting buffed, but Druid and Mage still being far and away the most powerful things, because the way that they interact with the game kind of pushes those buffed things out of the metagame. Uh, and specifically, I actually think that Enrage Warrior, if it weren't for Starfish, would very, very possibly be a legitimate deck. Um, but, you know, between getting all your, your your things that you buff Frozen by Mage and getting Starfish by Druid or a bunch of other decks, uh, or just running into Quest Priest, which just has a million anti-aggro things along with Shard of the Naru to, to silence all your stuff, um, because they're playing that to beat the rogue decks, well, that's, that's a nightmare too. So anyway, uh, those are my thoughts. Uh, I, you know... I'd love to see specifically the hero cards and Druid and Mage toned down. Screw Null. Also, I still want Hunter Quest deleted, but uh, it's also one of the funny things. Uh, the, the the prominence of, of decks like Mage or like Shaman that freeze your board repeatedly is, is one of the things that drives people to play decks like Hunter Quest <laughs> that are miserable to play against because they try to completely ignore the board. And when, when you sort of have a metagame that's trending that way, I think that's fundamentally a problem. Um, but as I mentioned moments ago, I, I don't think it's so big of a problem that we need like some sort of emergency patch to fix it. I've still been having fun playing stuff completely outside of these. I've been playing like Thief Priest and having reasonable success with it. I played a ton of uh, Quest Dude Paladin. Uh, and I actually had like almost an 80% win rate in the day that I played it, but I also ran into basically zero mages. Uh, and I was crushing rogues. That was, I think, the day that rogue was at the most popular, but mage hadn't quite uh, had, I don't know, had the coming out party or whatever. I ran into literally zero mages in like 40 games, which certainly contributed to that win rate. But I think there's a lot of stuff out there that, that can still be fun to play and reasonably successful. I, I, I do think that the metagame would be more fun with those changes, but I don't think it's kind of a desperation situation and like a, you know, sky is falling worst case scenario, like a lot of people seem to be suggesting. But anyway, Hearthstone team, you have time now. Here's some thoughts. I hope you make some of these changes. Those of you out there who are not in the Hearthstone team, I hope you listen to what I have to say here and uh, let me know what you think. Do comment what you feel about the current metagame, what you'd like to see changed, where you uh, would prefer to play your sorts of games, you know, on the, on the field, on the board. 
I'm gonna get shot in the face by Hunter over and over. I know I don't. So let me know what you think. Thank you very much for watching. I appreciate you all listening to me. And I appreciate all your comments, all your likes, all your subscriptions. So thanks for watching. Thanks for supporting. And I will see you on hopefully less Frozen and less Hero Card covered Battlefield.